Hey guys, welcome back. Hope you're doing well. Uh, today I'm in Luminar Neo and I'm taking a look at a landscape. I'm going to walk through an example of an idea that I've really been, it's kind of been percolating in my mind a bit and show you how subtle and kind of simple moves over time and how you can stack them will really have a huge impact on your photo, which means you don't have to overdo it by pushing the sliders very far. You don't have to overcomplicate things. Overall, I guess the message is you don't have to hit an image over the head with a hammer to uh, to kind of get your point across, right? I want to walk through that and show you how I handled this scene and really, frankly, I think make a massive, massive difference in the photo without doing too much to it in terms of pushing the sliders. I do use a lot of tools. I use some masks and that's important stuff in editing because it gives you control over your image. You tell Luminar what to do. It's got AI. That's fantastic. AI is just helping you automate tasks that would be manually intensive and potentially hard or challenging. It's doing that for you. But what I don't want to do is have AI edit a photo for me. I want to be in control. And that's one of the things I'm talking about. So you can see I've got a photo here. It started life like that. That's the base raw file. This is a raw file. You can see I've used develop raw and erase to get some spots out and then super contrast. I'm currently like that. And if I show you super contrast, this is a very powerful tool. There it is before super contrast and there it is now. So I feel like those two tools are the ones that I start with 99% of the time because they give me so much control and power over balancing the light. That's my first step. But now that I've done that, I want to jump into some of the things that I would do to this photo to really get the final result that I want. So the first thing I do is I go into color harmony and I'm going to do a 10 on brilliance and I'm going to do a 12 on warmth. You can just type there uh, and add that value. And now that's going across the entire photo. And while I'm at it, I'm going to go into split color warmth and I'm going to do a negative, oops, a negative 15 there and a negative 10 right there. Now let me show you what that has done. There it is before and there it is now. So a little bit bluer, but also a little bit warmer, if that makes sense. The difference is is brilliance is every color getting more brilliant. Warmth is, of course, making it warmer. That's the warmth that you see. What I've done with split color warmth is I slightly neutralize some of the warmth, uh, but I also slightly increase some of the cool. It's just a, it's a delicate dance. I did this by experimenting. There's no particular thing that I specifically do every time with split color warmth, but there it was before, and there it is now. So that's color harmony. Notice these are not 40, 50, or 80 kind of things. This is 10, 15, but what I want to do now is actually close the tool and open it again again, because I love color balance. Um, I did a recent video about it. It's incredibly powerful and super amazing. I highly recommend using it if you don't. But in this case, I want to get into the highlights and I'm going to do a 30 here and I'm going to do a negative 11 on the magenta. Now, overall, that looks a little overdone, but it looks great in the sky. And that's where I take advantage of some of this masking technology or AI in this case, as I referred to in the beginning of the video, let it figure out the mask because it's going to do a better job than I. I am isolating that sky. There you go. I think that's done a pretty good job. The only thing I might would do is come back in with a brush and paint and I would take strength down a little bit and I would come over here and I would paint in some of these areas, this kind of transitional area where it slightly overlaps. I've done this in previous videos. It helps sometimes to come back and kind of paint in a little bit and you're kind of blending that together, but it's not getting the full effect on that edge. So I just think it looks a little bit better overall if you do something like that. Now, if I show you the before and after, there's the sky before, and there it is now slightly warmer because I went to 30 on the red and a negative 11 on the magenta, just a color preference for me. So I feel like the sky is looking pretty good. And in fact, I'm going to go back and I'm going to copy that mask, click on masking, click on mask actions, click on copy. Then I go to tools and I go to landscape and I'm going to get golden hour and I'm going to about a 50 here. So that's actually kind of high, but I'm going to paint it or paste it in just to the sky. And there we go. So if I show you that mask, same mask, I just copied from one tool to the other, but I was able to bring that over and give a little bit more warmth to that sky. There it is before and there it is now. So even though that number is kind of high at 50, doesn't have a huge impact because golden hour, it accentuates the warm tones. Well, there's not a lot of warm tones there. If this was a stunning sunset and I went to 50, it would be way overdone. So when I say don't overdo it, I'm speaking kind of in relative terms. 50 is a high number, but in terms of the golden tones that are already there that are being accentuated, it's not that much. So just kind of keep that in mind. Next up, I want to go to Accent AI, one of my favorite tools. Absolutely love this tool. Just be careful with it. And I tend to go a little bit later in my edit, like in this case, where I'm going to 30. So I tend not to do super high, but I am doing that across the entire photo, even though I often 
often recommend just doing it in a part of the photo with a radial mask, which is a super good way to kind of control it in a specific area. But in this case, I wanted to use it across the entire photo. So there it is before, and there it is now. It gives a nice little pop to that image. One of the key things for me that I really want to do is bring out those waterfalls. By the way, this is called Kirkjafell Foss, and Kirkjafell is that mountain. I think I'm pronouncing this correctly. This is in Iceland. This was on the Luminar Photo Camp back in November, but we went there one day, uh, actually after the camp ended, and it was just beautiful. It's a fantastic place. It's just so, so stunning. But what I want to do is make those waterfalls get a little bit brighter. So I'm going to do about a 39 there on exposure, and I'm going to go into whites as well. And here I'm going to do about a nine, but of course I need to get a mask. And so I want to go in and get a brush. And all I'm going to do is shrink my mouse and then paint it into the waterfalls. Okay, a little bit of painting with my brush, and that's my mask. You can see the areas that I painted over in pink, and that's what they look like now. So once you have the mask in place, you can go in and further refine the, uh, the amounts if you'd like to, but I think that looks pretty good. There it is before, and there it is now. In fact, I might go a slight bit higher, maybe a 45. I don't want to overdo it, but for me, waterfalls are a key component of a landscape photo that I want to accentuate, and I love to do that little trick with the develop tool and the exposure slider and the white slider just to make them pop a little bit. So that is looking good. Next up is Structure AI, which is just a fantastic tool. And I'm going to go to the mid 30s here and I'm going to click on masking. And let me take a look at Mask AI and see what it comes up with. It comes up with Flora uh, Architecture, which I'm not really sure about, but I'm going to click on that. I'm going to click on Mountains, Natural Ground, and Man-Made Ground and see what I come up with. And I've got that. I'm going to go ahead and click on Water as well. So that basically just filled up everything except for the sky, which is basically what I wanted to do, except there's a little bit over there in the sky on the right-hand side. I'm going to go to Brush and Erase, and I'm going to come over here and remove that. And I'm going to go into Paint, and uh, there was a spot right over here that was missed, so something like that just to fill in these little holes and in fact I see a couple around these waterfalls I will do that as well okay so now my mask looks like that and that's where it's been applied to so I think overall I wanted to bring up the structure I do that most of the time on natural elements, ground, rocks, and things like that. And the waterfalls, normally, it depends on the look I'm going for. If I'm going for an incredibly smooth, really long exposure kind of thing, I will not add structure to a waterfall, especially if it's a prominent part of the image. In this case, it's a small part. It pops a lot because I made it whiter and brighter on that last move, but you can't really see structure going into that waterfall very much. I mean, a tiny bit, and in fact, it makes it slightly brighter, which I think looks okay, but I'm good with that. I'm just going to leave it like that. But then I want to go in here and I want to go a negative value and I want to pop that into the sky. So one more time, mask AI, it's quicker now. I'm going to click on sky, let it pick the sky and apply that mask of negative structure into the sky. Looks pretty good. There's a tiny bit over here that it missed. So I can just go into brush. I'm in paint and I can just move my mouse over here if I'd like to. And honestly, I think that's close enough. And all I did is just negative structure in the sky to smooth it out. It's just a personal preference, not something that I would necessarily say you have to do. It's just something that I like. And really the only other thing left to do is a vignette. So I'm going to do something like a negative 30 or so and size is going to be about a 30 or so. I tend to like feathering uh, quite a bit and I also like inner light. I don't want to overdo the inner light but I want it to pop a little bit. It defaults to the center of the image. I'm actually going to scoot it down here a little bit lower left to get it a little bit more focused on the waterfall. You can just move that around to your heart's content and if you want to you can pop that uh, light a little bit more. I was at I think 12 I might go to 15. I don't want to overdo it. And then I also just want to check my settings on my vignette. I think I'm going to pull that back a little bit. Maybe make it slightly rounder. Let's just look at the before and after. Yeah, before and after. I think that looks good, honestly. So let me show you the entire before and after of this workflow video. Uh, there we go. That's what it started like. You can see there's been a lens correction. I've removed spots. I did develop a couple of times. I did super contrast. I did some color work. I did some accent AI. I did some structure, negative structure. I did a lot of things, honestly. But but my point is, even though I did a, a high number of things, most of them were kind of small moves. In other words, kind of subtle moves. But if you have enough of them and you stack them and stack them and stack them, these edits really do add up. So you take a photo like that, you look on the back of your camera and you think, yeah, it's not bad. I mean, it's a beautiful place, right? That doesn't mean the photo's any good, but hey, it's an incredibly, incredibly beautiful place, at least to my eye. And I loved standing there, but I was like,
like, yeah, you know, the sky is not inspiring. I wish it was better condition, blah, 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 whatever. With some key moves, you can come in and really turn it into something that you like. And in fact, now that I've had it off for so long, and this is a tip I recommend doing, is walking away and then coming back to your edit. Because as I held that down for long enough and was talking to you guys, when I came back to it, I thought it's a little too blue and it's a little too saturated. So you can fix both of those with one tool, which is develop. I would come in here and maybe pull that saturation down overall. So maybe like a negative 10 or 15, maybe, you know, negative, let's try 15. And maybe I'll give it a tiny, tiny bump in warmth, maybe something like that. So if I look at the before, there it is before. And the after, there it is now, slightly more realistic, a little bit less saturated, slightly warmer, which offsets the cool temp that I think I probably overdid in my first use of develop. So walk away if you need to and come back to it later. But that's a full workflow, my friends. And more importantly, as I said, you can take a photo that looks kind of blah and with enough moves, targeted, controlling the light, the detail, and the color, and just kind of manipulating things and stacking and stacking and stacking, you get really a significantly different result than what you think you might get. So don't always hit it over the head with a hammer and just slide the saturation or vibrance or whatever it might be. And trust me, I've done that a gazillion times and I'll do it again, I'm sure. But you don't have to to get a beautiful result that I think is subtle, beautiful, and yet realistic without being overdone. So that's how I did this one, my friends. Hope it gives you some ideas about how this kind of stuff works. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out that, that video, which I did recently about blown highlights and how you're able to control those. I think you'll find that useful and um, applicable in your own work. Thanks for watching, my friends. I'll see you soon. And until then, adios.